here's Dan. We are leaving Ireland, and before I finish this, we'll be in England. We had planned to stay in Ireland a few days, but we stayed two weeks. Why? I'll tell you. We were high over the Atlantic, dreaming about the weeks ahead. Mickey was taking advantage of his opportunity to chew a lot of free gum. Suddenly, the stewardess said, there's Ireland. We couldn't believe it. Imagine, supper in New York, breakfast in Ireland. The stewardess said this plane would be in Vienna by lunchtime. Kay and I decided that if it could be done this quickly, this easily, we'd do it every year. Pan-American World Airways, Jacques Ethel Decade. Attention please, Pan-American World Airways announces the arrival of flight number 100 from New York City. Thank you. When we landed at Shannon, the reporter was interviewing the passengers. Pardon me, ma'am, are you staying over in Ireland? Oh, no, I'm a study on the Vienna. I've not seen my people in six years. Oh, I see. Well, perhaps next year. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Are you staying over in Ireland at all? Yes, we're going to be here for several days. That's fine. Perhaps once you've had a taste of it, you'll make it several weeks. Oh, I'm afraid that's not possible this time. Well, that's a pity. Because speaking without prejudice, it's one of the grandest countries in the world. After a super breakfast at the airport, we hired a little car and drove north to Kong in County Mayo. Ashford Castle is one of several old castles that have recently been turned into hotels. It was once a hunting lodge for the Guinness family, the makers of the national beverage of Ireland. Only in our dreams did we ever think someday we'd live in a real castle. The grounds are beautiful, and there's everything to do here. Golf, tennis, sailing, and some of the best trout fishing in the world. Any fisherman can come back with a dozen or so of the biggest trout he's ever caught. All through the western section of Ireland, home industries flourish. The local folks do the whole job, from raising the sheep, to dyeing the yarn, and weaving the cloth. We drove to one quaint old thatch cottage where several girls of the neighborhood had gathered together to produce some of the prettiest homespun we've ever seen. The colors are gorgeous. Kay wanted to buy everything in sight. We did buy several pieces. Lucky for us, Pan American has increased the baggage allowance. In some districts, the Gaelic language is spoken. We stopped for a moment to listen to a Gaelic lullaby. I can't describe the grandeur of the Cliffs of Moher. Sheer rock rises 700 feet out of the sea. A fisherman there told us he brought up a family of 12 on milk potatoes and fish. Aye, it's a hard life, surely. 
It's the very devil of a life when the young children are grown. But we can't starve with the sea full of fish and the rocks covered with mussels as big as your fist. And we can't freeze either and plenty of fine turf in the bog. I, I'm thinking that some in the big cities have a harder life and they with money in the bank. We drove on through the valley of the Shannon past hundreds of tiny cottages with chimneys pouring out the incense of Ireland, the sweet smell of burning turf. The houses are whitewashed stone, and some are so small that a child might think them the houses of fairies. By the leisurely pace of life, we knew we were in a foreign country, all right, but there's no language problem. And the girls? Well, I, I can see why people get sentimental about Ireland. We got a great kick out of the villages and the philosophy of the people. In one village, we saw a group of men thatching a cottage roof. The owner was quite eloquent when Kay asked him how long it took to thatch a roof. Well, you see, it is this way. Several neighbors get busy on the one house so that they'll get it finished that day. And you know, ah, it is a light-hearted kind of work. One man sitting up on the roof with a leg hanging over each side and he roping down the thatch so that it won't be blown away. And down below, several of the neighbors helping them They'll be joking with them while they're pegging the rope into the gables. And that's the way we live. A little bit of this and a little bit of that kind of work. But glory be, isn't that better than doing the same thing over and over again? <laughs> like I seen a man in Galway once, and he doing nothing but sawing wood in the mill, day in and day out. And sure, what sort of a life is that for any man? Over here, it stays light till nearly 11 during the summer. So after supper, we cycled out to an old Franciscan friary, built in 1474. All Ireland is dotted with such ruins. Next on our list were the lakes of Killarney. The scenery is really something to look at. As the Irish say, the beat of it can't be found anywhere. The little town of Killarney is clean, attractive, and has great charm. Among the people we met was one delightful old fellow who loved Americans. All the Americans, oh, we all love the Americans here. They get wonderful reception. Everybody in Ireland likes America because the Americans are always very nice to Ireland, you know. And they believe in freedom. We all love to see them coming here for we have great hotels and all that. But we expect them to be coming here in thousands. I'm sure they'll be delighted to come here. We'll give them a great welcome and a great ovation to them all. The beautiful gardens and unusual plants make a botanist's paradise. Remember, Stan, you suggested taking a trip into the Kerry country? Well, we did. The one we enjoyed most was the trip through the Gap of Dunlow and back, which took all day. You ride horseback through the Gap, 10 long miles. One look at us, and they recommended the boarding platform.
There was a cottage along the way where we stopped to have a cup of tea and buy a few souvenirs. After a picnic lunch, we returned through the three blue lakes of Killarney. Shooting the rapids was a great thrill to Mickey. I was a little excited myself. we decided to stay a few days longer. The reporter was right. We had really fallen in love with Ireland and its friendly people. We went to Cork because Mickey insisted on kissing the Blarney Stone. Robert Gibbings says Cork is the loveliest city in the world. And anybody that doesn't agree either was not born there or is prejudiced. The streets are wide. The keys are clean. The bridges are noble, and always in the background we could hear the music of the Shandon Bells, about which the famous poem was written. So we went to see them. Kay asked one of the children playing on the church grounds to recite the poem for us. With deep affection and recollection, I often think of the Shandon Bells, who sound so wild, wooden days of childhood, sing round my crib their magic spells. On this I ponder, where'er I wander, and thus grow fonder, sweet cork of thee. With thy bells of Shandon, that sound so grand, on the pleasant waters of the River Lee. Five miles from Cork, in the middle of a pretty park, are the ruins of Blarney Castle. The first question Mickey asked when we entered the grounds was, where is the Blarney Stone? The Blarney Stone? Do you want to kiss the Blarney Stone? Well, there it is. Right up there, that stone held by those two bars, that's the Blarney Stone. So we climbed to the roof of the castle, and Mickey sat down with his back to the 150-foot drop while the guide held his feet. He was lowered over the edge, and after much wriggling, managed to kiss the base of the stone. We haven't seen any change in his speech yet. All the signs are written in both Gaelic and English. We headed for the plains of Tipperary to see the Rock of Cashel. It's a great mass of rock, a natural fortress, right on the plains of Tipperary. In about the year 450, St. Patrick came here and at this very cross converted the king. Kings lived on the Rock of Cashel for centuries both before and after the time of St. Patrick, and one of them, Cormac McCarthy, built a chapel. It's an impressive piece of architecture with its high stone roof and Norman decoration. They told us it's the oldest stone structure in the country. There is nothing else quite like it in the whole world. As we entered the cathedral, it gave us a queer feeling to think that St. Patrick and Henry II and Edward Bruce had all walked on this very same ground. There were fragments of sculpture all over the place. Mickey was fascinated by this interesting old figure.
From the balcony, we looked out and for miles around could see the plains of Tipperary, the birthplace of many famous racehorses. So we extended our stay, and the next day drove to the Balakistine Stud Farm. Kay asked the stud groom why this section of Ireland is so famous for horse breeding. He said it was a limestone plain and the best bone-making country in the world. Nothing looks less like a racehorse than a fluffy foal. We saw a string of beautiful yearlings. The stud groom looked at them with the expression of a mother. They're going to the yearling sales at Newmarket, and a better batch of yearlings has never left the country. Poor little devils, they don't know what's up. This is the first time they've been on the roads. You see that filly? She's by the Phoenix, and she's worth 10,000 pounds if she's worth a penny. I reckon there's 70,000 pounds worth of horse flesh in front of us this morning. One of the stallions, the Phoenix he is called, is valued at 60,000 pounds, about $250,000. He's a magnificent beast. One of the loveliest places in Ireland is the little valley of Glendalough. A tall round tower rises above the trees. One of those towers peculiar to Ireland and built nearly a thousand years ago as a belfry and refuge from the Danes. The entrance was built high so that those who sought refuge could pull up the ladder after them and feel secure from attack. If you can put your arms around the Celtic cross and touch your fingers, you get your wish. Kay wished that we could return to Ireland next year. It looks like a date. Nearby is St. Kevin's Kitchen, where St. Kevin lived after he retired from the world. It has the same type stone roof found on other Celtic buildings. Later we had lunch on the banks of the lake, and the boatman fed us a little blarney. Tell me, how deep that lake out there? Well, now, the lake, sir. Well, now, that lake is so deep that when my sister went bathing there a short while back, she sank. And we never heard a word from her until we got a letter from Liverpool telling us to send on some dry clothing. That's how deep it is. <laughs> we couldn't leave Ireland without visiting Dublin. What an aristocrat among cities. They say O'Connell Street is the widest main street in the world. Could be. Anyhow, its shops are fun to browse in and its people, as elsewhere in Ireland, are courteous and friendly. Oman Ireland rides a bicycle. At least, that's the way it looked during the noon rush on O'Connell Street. We hired a jaunting car and had a hilarious time listening to the Jarvie. The older residential sections with their red brick Georgian mansions reminded us of similar sections in our own cities. The distinctive doors are really something to behold. Jarvie's story about his master and the donkey was the best yet. You see that house over there? 
Well, that house belongs to me old master, Dennis McCarthy. Oh, many's the night I was in and out of that house when he'd be in one of his bar turns. In one of his tantrums, you know. Look at it. There was nights that that man never went to bed at all. Will I ever forget the morning that he thought he saw the devil coming up that way? Look at the two hordens on him, says he. And he outs with his gun and he shot him. <laughs> and be that wasn't his own donkey. <laughs> Trinity College, right in the heart of Dublin, is the leading educational institution of Ireland. It was founded by Queen Elizabeth in 1591. The quadrangle is paved with cobblestones, worn smooth by 350 years of students' footsteps. Be sure to tell everyone to visit the library at Trinity, where they will see one of the most precious books in existence, the famous Book of Kells. In about 600 AD, an unknown Irish monk in an abbey at Kells was copying the Gospels in illuminated writing. He was one of the world's greatest artists, enriching his book with a thousand beauties of intricate designs. He poured into it all the power of his imagination. When you turn the pages, you turn back the centuries to a world of Irish saints and ancient Irish culture. Don't miss the Abbey Theatre, birthplace of so many famous plays and players. The building is not impressive, but the performances are something to be remembered. The actors and sings Riders to the Sea and The Well of the Saints, which we saw, were top-notch. For anyone interested in sports, Dublin has plenty to offer. We saw horse races at Phoenix Park and exciting dog races in the evening. You know, dog racing and breeding is almost as popular as horse racing. And we saw an exciting hurley game at Croke Park. Hurley, similar to our field hockey, is the national game of Ireland. There are several excellent golf courses. My game could be improved. And we saw some superb riding and jumping at the spring show. In other words, we had plenty of fresh air and fun. Our friends insisted we should join a fox hunt. So a weekend was arranged with the master of the Tipperary hunt. We were out early because we didn't want to miss anything. This was a lawn meet. The huntsmen assembled at the home of the master about 11 a.m. The whip came up with the hounds. 70 of them, or 35 couple, as they say. The master of the gallant tips is recognized as one of the greatest horsewomen in Ireland. She knew every hound by name. There were about two dozen riders. They explained that this was a small meet, for it was late in the season. Sometimes there are as many as 100 riders. We followed on foot. There were quite a few of us because fox hunting in Ireland is a community sport. For everyone who actually follows hounds, there are a hundred who have a sporting interest. The master and the whip moved on to a thick laurel covert, and into this, the hounds were thrown. Soon the hounds started to fox, and pandemonium broke loose. The hounds really made with the noise, or as the Irish say, gave great tongue.
Mickey got a great kick out of the fact that children also hunt. There are almost as many children as grown-ups. Stan, this is the life. I could spend several months a year on this emerald isle and enjoy every minute of it. The hounds killed in the open and the fox's tail, or the brush, was presented to the first lady up. Yesterday we attended a fesh, or festival. Feshes are held all over Ireland to perpetuate the early culture. Gaelic music and poetry and dancing. Several contests go on at the same time, and at the end of the day, prizes are awarded the winners. we took the clipper, and in a few minutes we'll be in London. Believe me, we had one grand time in Ireland. <laughs>